Welcome to the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast. Today we are going through part two of our MPT review. Your Bar Exam Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the bar exam experience so you can study effectively, stay sane, and hopefully pass and move on with your life. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on your favorite listening app and check out our sister podcast, the Law School Toolbox Podcast. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on barexamtoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we are walking through a multi-state performance test. This is another in our series of podcasts talking about how to approach questions on the UBE. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcasts so you won't miss any upcoming discussions. Note that for the performance test, you should check out our discussions on both the California and the UBE since the formats are extremely similar. So this episode is a little bit different from our discussions on how to approach essays, because instead of covering the law you'll need to know and then how to apply it to the question, we've divided this MPT up into two podcasts. And today we're talking about how to approach drafting your answer for the February 2018 performance test. This particular performance test asks you to draft a memo. If you haven't listened to part one of this podcast, you might want to take a break from this one and go back and listen to that one. So before we get started on the fundamentals of drafting this MPT, we'd like to refresh your memory about the timing of these tests. You have exactly 90 minutes to complete each performance test. This includes reviewing the library and the file and drafting. We recommend splitting that time, 45 minutes working through the library and file, and then 45 minutes drafting the essay. While you're working through the file and library, it may be tempting to start drafting an outline, but we discourage you from doing that. Highlight, underline, jot down notes in the margin, but save the outlining and for the drafting portion of the test. In our last podcast, we worked through the task memo with all of the instructions, the file and the library. This time we get to talk about how to create an outline and how to turn that outline into a great essay answer. So let's quickly refresh our memory about the task memo. A partner at a law firm has asked you to draft a memo answering a few questions from her friend, Danielle Hastings. Danielle is a board member of her local MUD municipal security, municipal utility district. She would like to become more civically involved. So she's asking whether she's allowed to serve on the MUD board while also serving as either an election judge or a political party precinct chair. The partner who has given you this assignment is not asking you to argue one way or another. Rather, she wants you to know, rather, she wants to know all legal issues regarding relating to each position. This means that you will carry an objective tone through your essay. Also note that she's asked you not to include a separate statement of facts. Now, based on the task memo, we know we're going to have two major sections in the outline. First, can someone serve as a MUD board member and an election judge simultaneously? And second, can someone serve as a MUD board member and a political party precinct chair simultaneously? Note that these two sections of your outline will correspond to two main sections in your discussion. For your own benefit and to make things easier on your grader, we recommend using these sections as headings in your final memo. In each section of your outline, you need to address the political, legal issues, and the material facts surrounding those issues. So let's talk briefly about the facts before we get started. In the file, we had a transcript of the phone call between the partner and Danielle. We also had a printout that described the roles of election judges and precinct chairs. From the call transcript, we learned that mud boards provide water, sewage, and drainage services to Danielle's neighborhoods, Eagle Springs. We also learned that being an election judge, an appointed position would put Danielle in a position of overseeing elections in her precinct. If she were appointed as an election judge, she would be the chief judge because the governor is from her party. She tells us that being a precinct chair is an elected position, meaning she would reach out to voters to educate them about candidates. The printout gives us more information. Election judges are appointed for two-year terms and are in charge of election day activities. The judges are nominated by their political parties, but are not allowed to display party affiliation during the election. 
They are volunteers and are reimbursed for expenses. Precinct chairs are elected by their political parties during a primary every two years. They organize the campaign and serve as voting members of their party's executive committee. This is another uncompensated position. So let's move to the outline. Remember that formulaic writing is best for these types of assignments. We want to make sure that we properly sort and analyze the information, and the IRAC structure is a good way to do this. The IRAC formula will serve you well regardless of the format, memo, brief, and so on. Now remember, this doesn't mean that you should have the IRAC formula for each section overall. This means that, if possible, you should break each section into smaller issues and use IRAC to come up with many conclusions on each of the sub-issues, setting yourself up for an easy conclusion on each main issue. So what does this mean for your outline? We'll start with a clear issue statement and then we'll provide the rules we gleaned from the library portion of our packet and use those rules to figure out how to further break down our main issues. After this, we will analyze Danielle's situation based on the facts provided in the file and the rules. In the analysis section, we will cite the Attorney General letters, state constitutional provision, and statute from the library. We will also make a note of the cases cited by the Attorney General that we need to analyze, analogize to. And then finally, we come to a conclusion. So in your outline, make a header that states the first issue. Can Danielle duly hold a MUD director position and a county election position? Remember, you're not making a persuasive argument either way. Because you will be drawing a conclusion based on the facts and the law, it is important to keep an objective voice. Before we get further into the outline, it is a good place to note that the MUD position is a civil office within the meaning of Article 12, Section 25, so that the exceptions to the rule against dual offices of emolument will not apply. Danielle is not a member of any of the accepted groups. You should make a note of this in your next major outline section too. Next, let's hit the R in the IRAC. Here you will list the relevant rules. Unlike in other bar exam essays, you will need to quickly cite where you found the rule. This particular MPT requires a fair bit of rule analysis, so we will need to invest some time in this part of the outline. So, here's a list of what it would look like. Number one, Article 12, Section 25 of the Franklin Constitution provides that subject to certain exemptions, no person shall hold or exercise at the same time more than one civil office of emolument. Number two, an emolument is a pecuniary profit, gain, or advantage. This is from the Attorney General position number 2039. It includes salaried compensation as well as compensation per meeting or a fixed per diem. The term emolument does not include reimbursements. Number three, if an office holder is entitled to compensation, his or her office is an office of emolument, even if the person refuses to accept any compensation. This is also from the 2003 opinion. Number four, the constitutional dual office holding provision applies to both positions, one, that qualify as civil offices, and two, are entitled to an emolument. This is also the 2003 opinion. Number five, the determinative factor distinguishing an officer from an employee is whether any sovereign function of the government is conferred upon the individual to be exercised by the individual for the benefit of the general public, largely independent of the control of others. This is also from 2003. This is known as the Morris test. Number six, if only one of the positions in question qualifies as a civil office and or both do not involve entitlement to compensation, then Article 12, Section 25 does not bar dual service. And this is from the 2008 Attorney General opinion. So let's pause here and consider the rules above. These all deal on whether the office is a civil office of emolument. We know from these rules that this is one way Danielle could be prevented from taking the election judge position. So the first subsection of this part of our discussion may have the heading whether the MUD director position and or the election judge position is a civil office of emolument. If you like, this can be further broken down into a discussion of whether each individually would be a civil office and whether each individually would be an office of emolument. We will discuss how to do that in a few minutes. But first, here are some more rules. I told you, there'd be a lot of rules. Number seven, the common law doctrine of incompatibility may apply even if the emoluments issue does not. This is from the 2008 opinion. Number eight, 
The doctrine of incompatibility prohibits the simultaneous holding of two civil offices that would prevent a person from exercising independent, disinterested judgment in either or both positions. This is the 2010 opinion. Compensation, this is number nine. Compensation is not relevant in determining whether offices are incompatible. Rather, the common law doctrine of incompatibility bars one person from holding two civil offices if their duties conflict. This is the 2008 opinion. Number 10. The doctrine of incompatibility has three aspects, self-appointment, self-employment, and conflicting loyalties. Now, self-appointment and self-employment are implicated only if the responsibilities of one position include appointing or employing the second position. Number 11. As a threshold matter, in order for the conflicting loyalties prong to apply, each position must constitute a civil office. Number 12. The same Morris test for determining whether dual positions constitute civil offices under Article 12, Section 25 of the Franklin Constitution also applies to the determination of whether dual positions constitute civil offices under the doctrine of incompatibility. If both positions constitute civil offices, subject to the doctrine of incompatibility, then the analysis shifts to whether the positions have powers and duties that are incompatible with each other. And last, number 13, if one position is able to control and impose its policies on the other position, such that the individual would have divided loyalties, then the two offices are incompatible. All right, so that's a lot of rules. But we're going to take a minute to look at the next set of rules. These all talk about whether the doctrine of incompatibility applies, which makes a great opportunity for another subsection, perhaps a subsetting to the effect of whether the MUD director position and the elector election judge position are incompatible. Take note, these headings make great issue statements for your mini IRACs. Now, if the library file included cases, you would have a section here with a quick discussion of the cases, but because the attorney general letters merely cited to cases, you can rely on the list of rules for this outline. We will move on to the analysis now, the A in the IRAC formula. Note that you should fit your analysis in with the appropriate rules so that you are analyzing each rule in turn. We will interweave them into our discussion of the analysis. Now, as you begin your analysis, you will want to note the overlapping constitutional and common law issues that apply when someone seeks to hold two offices. The civil office of emolument is the constitutional issue, and the common law doctrine of incompatibility is the common law issue. You will need to apply both of these principles as you determine whether Danielle can hold two offices. This will be made easier by the dividing up the issues within your subheadings. So let's review the bullet points for each section. Each number indicates a separate outline bullet point. Use the facts from the file and the information from the library to describe the role of a MUD director. First, let's talk about whether the MUD directors and or election judges hold civil offices. This can be your first subheading in this section. So number one, MUDs provide water, sewer, drainage, and other municipal services to suburban communities. They are local government entities, are subject to the Franklin Water Code, and are responsible for the management of all affairs in the district. This is from 2008. MUDs are one of the most fundamental forms of local government. They provide municipal services, have elected officials, are authorized to charge fees and collect taxes, and they can sell bonds to fund their projects and services. Number two, Danielle's position on the MUD board constitutes a civil office. So the next issue is whether a county election judge is also a civil officer under the Franklin Constitution. Number three, in 2003, the Attorney General came to the conclusion that emergency service commissioners were civil officers under Morris because they have the power to appoint agents and employees, collect taxes, and perform other acts necessary to providing emergency services. In 2000, Number four, in 2008, the Attorney General concluded that planning commissioners were also civil officers under Morris because they are appointed by the city and have certain city powers. Number five. Now turn to election judges. Danielle would be the chief election judge in her precinct because she is the same political party as the last elected governor. The printout describe, description indicates that they are appointed by the Board of Commissioners and are responsible for conducting elections. So under this section, subsection A, 
The judges secure the election, retain election clerks, organize the setup, and hand out collection ballots, set up and close the polls, certify results, and serve on a panel to resolve voting-related challenges. They are delegated the authority to handle all election issues in their precincts. Subsection B. The Franklin Election Code provides that the chief judge is in charge of the election process, which includes appointing clerks, designating working hours, preserving order, and preventing breaches of the peace and election code violations, and administering oaths. Subsection C. The powers of the chief judge are delegated by the state legislature and exercised for the benefit of the public, independent of the control of others. So our conclusion? Given the facts and rules under the analysis above, county election judges are civil officers under Morris. Because they are civil officers, there is a need to determine whether there is an office of emolument. So this brings us to our next subheading, whether MUD directors and or election judges hold offices of emolument. So number one, in 2003, the attorney general said that an amount received as compensation, such as a fixed per diem amount, is an emolument. So the MUD position is an office of emolument because Danielle receives a per diem. Number two, the printout in the file reveals that election judges, however, receive no payment and are only reimbursed for actual expenses. So this means that the position is not a civil office of emolument. So our conclusion is that the Constitution does not prohibit Danielle from holding both positions because the election judge position is not an office of emolument. So now we come to our third subheading in this section, whether MUD directors and election judges are incompatible. Now, according to our rules, this requires the examination of three potential conflicts, self-appointment, self-employment, and conflicting loyalties. Now, MUD directors do not appoint or employ election judges, and election judges do not appoint or employ MUD directors. The first two prongs of the doctrine do not apply. Now, the conflicting loyalty prong involves more analysis. The MUD district is located in Danielle's precinct, MUD directors are elected and election judges oversee the elections. In the call transcript, Danielle indicates that the MUD elections are entirely separate from county elections. Because there is no jurisdictional or temporal overlap, county election judges have no influence over MUD directors and MUD directors have no influence over election judges. Now, referring back to the Attorney General opinion, Danielle's situation be more like the 2010 opinion where a school trustee could serve as a county treasurer than in a 2008 opinion where a MUD director could not serve on the city's planning and zoning commission. So what's our conclusion? The common law doctrine of incompatibility does not bar Danielle from serving as both a county election judge and a MUD director, and there's no constitutional or statutory bar. Now that you've analyzed and concluded on each subsection individually, it's easy to draw an overall conclusion about the election judge position, right? Neither the Franklin Constitution or the common law doctrine of incompatibility bar Danielle from serving as both a MUD director and a county election judge, so she should feel comfortable seeking a position as a county elected judge. And that's it for the first major section of the outline. We intertwine the most important facts of the rules, and it will soon be important to include those facts in the essay. So let's move on to the next major section of the outline, just as we did above, let's follow the IRAC formula. And the good news is we've already done a fair bit of the analysis that we need for this section. So here's the issue header for this section. Can a person serve as both a MUD director and a precinct chair? Note that the same rules apply to this section as to the above section. So your subsections can be similar. Just as we did above, we will incorporate the most important facts in the outline Again, in this section, we will want to refer to relevant citations as we make analogies and distinctions, but do not copy and paste law. So let's jump to the outline levels. So we know, as discussed above, that the position of the MUD director is a civil office of emolument. If the precinct chair is also a civil office of emolument under Article 12, Section 25, then Danielle cannot hold both positions. The first step of the analysis requires a determination of whether the precinct chair is a civil office. Note that this can be your first subheading and then state the rule for determining what a civil office is. We know that precinct chairs are the political agents of their political parties in their districts. According to the position description in the printout from the file, they are responsible for contracting and organizing voters in the precinct and for campaigning. 
and precinct chairs represent their precinct and their party's executive committee. This is a political and partisan position. Now, under Morris, a position that is civil must involve a sovereign function of the government that is conferred upon an individual for the benefit of the general public. Now, because the activities of precinct chairs are political, not sovereign governmental functions, they do not benefit the general public. So this position is unlike county election judges because there is no delegated statutory authority. So the precinct chair is not a civil office. So it is neither subject to the Franklin Constitution nor the common law doctrine of incompatibility. So technically, our analysis does not need to go farther than that. But it would be smart to dispatch of the other two prongs of the analysis, possibly with a short discussion under a subheading of whether the precinct chair position is an office of emolument or subject to the doctrine of incompatibility or something similar. And there, note that even if the position were a civil office, it is an unpaid volunteer position with no overlap of responsibility or jurisdiction with the mud board. So the common law doctrine of incompatibility would not apply. So that's it for this section of the outline. You'll want to include a brief conclusion here too. Because of the position of precinct chair is not a civil office, it would not violate the Franklin Constitution or the common law doctrine of incompatibility if Danielle pursued it in addition to her MUD director position. Now, great work getting through the outline. Now we can work on drafting the essay. This has already been mentioned several times, but it's important to pay attention to the task memo. You may even want to go back and read it again. Remember, you've been asked to write an objective memo. Because this is objective, you need to structure the essay in a way that does not attempt to persuade. So this begins with an issue statement, and here's an example of what the issue statement should look like in the first section. Our client, Danielle Hastings, would like to know whether she could serve as a member of a MUD board of directors while also serving as a county election judge. Remember, this statement doesn't make an argument. It's an objective essay, and you're just setting up the framework for legal analysis. So then, set up the two headings, one for each position to be discussed and all the appropriate subheadings that we discussed in our outline above. Then draft your rule statements for each subsection and make sure that you're keeping the facts in mind. And remember, you're going to need to provide citations for those rule statements. So start the rule statement by sketching out rules you have learned from the library and then draw from the relevant attorney general letters and cases cited to fill out the rules. Then pull in those material facts related to the rules so you can begin to create analogies between the relevant offices and the offices the Attorney General works through. You'll talk about civil positions of emolument first, and then we'll address the common law doctrine of incompatibility. Next, just work through your analysis of each subsection, and take your time here because it's a great place to rack up analysis points. You can use the outlines and checklist to make sure you address each of the material facts. And finally, you need to come to your conclusion for each subsection and there's an overarching conclusion for each section. Here you will resolve the issue and tell the reader why you resolved it in a particular way. A strong conclusion almost always has the word because in it. You would be smart to add a final conclusion adding summarizing your overall findings for both sections that will also make it look like you didn't run out of time. So remember that the MPT is a writing test. The examiners want to know that you can both analyze a complex legal issue and construct a compelling explanation of all the relevant facts in law. This means it is important to write well. Unless specifically told in the task memo, don't use bullets. Complete sentences instead of bullet points will show the examiners that you're able to write well about any issue given to you. Use paragraphs with logical flow and make sure your sentences are orderly, complete, and concise. The easier you can make it for the examiners, the more points you stand to gain. And with that, we're out of time. I want to take a second to remind you to check out our blog at baregamtoolbox.com, which is full of helpful tips to help you prepare and stay sane as you study for the bar exam. You can also find information on our website about our courses, tools, and one-on-one tutoring programs to support you as you study for the UBE or California bar exam. If you enjoyed this episode of the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you are still in law school, you might also like to check out our popular Law School Toolbox podcast as well. 
If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at Lee at BarExamToolbox.com or Allison at BarExamToolbox.com or you can always contact us via our website contact form at BarExamToolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon. Mm-hmm.